It's but, just a four hours difference, I believe. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's not, not bad. Far. It's not so far. Four o'clock in the afternoon. So. Yep. So that means only three hours difference, three which hours is difference, good. Yes. And but unfortunately for uh, Randy, it's a long time away. So long time, yes. exactly. it's early morning for him. So let's Absolutely. see. Uh, if, I'm just going to see if he's he's already in. Not yet. But all the all the participants that are waiting to be admit uh, it will uh, host to admit. I have not to admit. There is uh, someone other. Someone other else that admit all the other participant. Ricardo, what do you mean? Uh, I I see the the room, the waiting room. Yeah. So I have not to admit anyone. There is someone else that are admitting to the to the conference. Already. <laughs> okay. Tariq? Professor Tariq has joined in now. Okay. So we'll have him soon. Um, and we have um, the other person who's uh, the other moderator is Bari, and I don't see him here yet. I think it's still five minutes to go. Yeah, so, so it's still Bari, time. Actually, uh, yes, uh, Tariq, salam alaikum. Tariq. Uh, Yes, it's connected, and the microphone and video is... Uh, He's uh, hiding somewhere. <laughs> How are you? Can you see uh, me? Yes. 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 <laughs> Hi, Tariq. Hi, brother. Good to see you. And well done. You all did a great job in Italy. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we, you need to come here now to give us some expertise in Pakistan. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Randy is not yet connected. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, okay. That's Randy. Still, uh, Barry is also still not with us? Not yet. Um, so be, uh, we begin with the ICP guidelines? Um, yes, yes, we do. Um, that's the plan. Good morning. Good morning. So, oh, here we are. I believe he's in. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Good morning. How are you? So, oh, so yeah, all, the, all this fun. snowfall is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe it will be a little cooler there, huh? <laughs> it, you, it might give us some migraine as well. <laughs> a lot of it coming down. <laughs> you look good, man. You look healthy. Good. Good for you. How's everything? Good, good. Busy. Actually, really busy, but uh, healthy. And the COVID thing hasn't helped, obviously. And it, it's, it's, I hope you're not hit, hit with the second wave or anything? No, we've had a little bit of a blip as things have been released. But, uh, uh, you know, our, we don't have anybody on ECMO right now. And our, our uh, ICUs are opening back up for the usual That's business. So Brilliant. Yeah. And your workload is back to normal self or...? Well, yeah, uh, we actually were pretty busy on the trauma side all the way through because we're the only trauma center for a huge area. Um, but I was also helping in ICU with COVID patients during other times. So, you know, it was pretty busy for a while. Yeah, because Randy, for us... uh, can I ask you a question, Randy? Uh, was every trauma patient being tested for COVID or the yes. only ones who we suspected? Well, if they came in and they were uncleared, untested as negative, we had to operate in N95s or Pappers, which was okay. was a real pain. So we had a special special room set off and special protocols. If they'd been cleared, but that took a little bit of time, um, then we could operate as usual. So we did a lot of cases in protective gear. Yeah, must have been quite tiring. It was, you know, those stupid Pappers. You can't hear, and and so yeah, you're exactly. you're screaming, you know, give me a bipolar. <laughs> Wasn't much yeah, you need, you need strong lungs for that. I totally agree. And yes. some people get headaches for, you know, if you're wearing them for a long time, you get headaches. Yeah, no, I agree. A lot of people just can't tolerate them either. You know. So, so we're nearly set. Uh, we've got a minute to go. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we're just waiting for our second co-host. Let's see if he's come in. Not yet. So I think we're going to start. How many participants do we have? 
at the moment you're 55 you're building right. okay. uh, okay. we have sure. uh, two, we had another webinar which it hasn't finished was on deformity so i just left yes, that probably uh, now so so that's yeah one it's, inch it's, back on the increase <laughs> of 61 so so the, the the people are saying hello on the other webinar and they are fast to discuss <laughs> <laughs> So I think um, so, you, so you have just to for the operating theater two line uh, COVID or no COVID and for the clinicians uh, do you have also a gray zone I mean the supposed COVID waiting for testing? Well, we yeah. treat those like COVID patients. Mm -hmm. So I think we, everybody's tested at the moment. If you suspect, then they get tested. Yeah. Yeah. And a fair number of antibody testing, although I don't know what that means, actually, to be honest. Yeah, nobody knows about that. You no. still need to do test, COVID test, even if you have the antibodies. Sorry? You still need to do the uh, COVID test, even if you are positive with yes. the antibodies. Yeah, there's no definite immunity from it, for sure. Well, we'll see. <clears throat> so this, my session is an hour. Um, or I, I give I give my talk and then then does Corrado give his talk? I do have a case going on since it's morning here. I, I don't have to go right away, but I just need to know when I can get loose. I think what uh -huh. we could do is I, ideally we wanted both the cases, but you can finish your thing and then we can um, uh, we can let you go if you are uh, tied up. Okay, I'll try try not to be, but uh, I'll try to stay as long as possible. I can moderate the time. Don't worry. Go ahead. Yeah, the problem, of course, is being at home. No one ever lets you off the hook. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, uh, Naveed, uh, uh, okay. uh, would you like to you start? Me, yeah, someone, please, uh, could you please let me know how much time do we have allocated for Randy and then for uh, Corrado? Uh, um, all together, um, it's an hour and a half, so uh, we can adjust so, time okay. accordingly. No, right, no problem. No, but uh, thanks we, very can, much. we can, we can oh, even overrun. It's not a problem because no, we not have not, to... Okay. Uh, Zoom booking anyway. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Samar. Now, um, I think we should begin officially, and I very warmly welcome the participants, and especially Randy and Corrado, uh, to this great academic exercise, and especially throwing in their weight behind this uh, excellent ongoing activity. This is an educational uh, activity, I believe, and which I am sure has benefited the residents and young neurosurgeons like me alike. So um, uh, none of our speaker needs introduction as these two neurosurgeons are uh, the bellwethers in neurotraumatology, I believe. And we begin uh, with a talk on ICP monitoring um, guidelines. And of course, when we talk about ICP guidelines and monitoring, um, this resonates with uh, Randall Chestnut. And uh, Randy, can I please ask you to take over and make us more aware and enlightened about the ICP guidelines and monitoring. Okay, I'd be glad to. Um, thank you very much for this great opportunity. Uh, I'm going to uh, to share my screen here. Um, let's see if I can so get it can to work. Turn off so that you get the whole thing. For the set, share like... screen thing isn't going through. Oh, here, here, here. It, it is. is going okay. through, Andy. So let me get to the talk. Um, <clears throat> it's morning here. I think it's afternoon there. So we will uh, we will uh, try to get started here. Um, what I'm going to do is let's see if I can get this back to the beginning. Sorry, it's a little bit. Okay, no problem. Hide floating, hide video panel. Um, go to here. Go to the start. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to talk about uh, ICP monitoring and the both in terms of indications and methods, as well as complications and pitfalls. So I'd like to give sort of an intro to ICP monitoring, uh, all the basic details about getting started with it, where it works, where it might not work, and how to think of it. Now, in, uh, come on, 
I'm not advancing for some reason here. Um, now I'm going to try to give a lecture that's meaningful around the world in different realities, because the truth is in the US there is a Native American saying that you should never judge another person until you've walked two weeks in their shoes. Um, you know, I come from a high income country uh, where my ICU has everything. Not everybody lives in that reality. And so there's a big schism between what gets published and maybe what is useful in a lot of parts of the world. For the last two decades, however, a little more actually, I've been working in Latin America in areas that are not the same as mine, in areas with a lot more resource limitations. So I think I've got a decent idea of what can be used around the world rather than what can be used at 15 centers in the US and Europe. And so I'm gonna try to give you something that you can take home and use, a practical education. I hope it works. A number of years ago, a three of us, Jam Gajar, Don Marion and I, started the guidelines process because we wanted to show people that the evidence mandated monitoring intracranial pressure, that you had to do it based on the evidence. Of course, we found out that that wasn't true, that there wasn't solid enough evidence to show that. And so we called for a randomized trial. And in the course of that trial, of course, I sort of looked like I went to the dark side where I, we did a randomized trial. And it didn't really mandate that you have to monitor ICP to have decent outcomes in in all head injured patients. Um, now that paper caused tremendous controversy to the extent that we ended up having to have a meeting to create a consensus interpretation of what that trial should mean to people treating traumatic brain injury. One of the statements from that meeting was that for those currently monitoring ICP, the results of the best TRIP trial should not change their practice. So basically, if you have ICP monitoring, you should not stop using it. You should use it when it's available. And that's consistent with the actual study results. However, mm -hmm. another study result was that it, if you don't have ICP monitoring, we our protocol, the one that was used in that trial, produced good outcomes, quite acceptable outcomes. So if ICP monitoring is not available, aggressive protocolized care can lead to good outcomes. So it's actually a message of hope for people in all levels of resources. And I think that's a very important implication of the best trip trial as well. Because things vary a lot around the world with resources, depending on what is available. And the truth is, is that the imaging and clinical examination protocol from the non-monitored arm of the best trip trial produced very acceptable results in the aggregate group, the combined group of people with uh, admitted in with severe traumatic brain injury. It mandates really that strong ICU care is essential, that absolute ICP control is not necessary. You need to treat intracranial hypertension suspected but knowing whether it's 20 or 22 may not make that much difference in most people. And that good outcomes are possible with limited resources. So no matter where you're from, it's a message of hope for traumatic brain injury care. And let's just look at where the dollars might go in reality. If you have a severe traumatic brain injury patient and, and a limited amount of money, where should you put it? Should you put it in an ICP monitor? Or should you put it in a CT scanner that works and is reliable and available? Well, no doubt where that money should go. How about if it's an ICU bed versus an ICP monitor? Or perhaps an extra ventilator? Or perhaps resuscitation fluids that the patient doesn't have to buy? Pre-hospital care? Or rehabilitation post-hospital care? Trying to make the patient you work so hard on do well when they leave hospital. So there's really no question about the prioritization of limited dollars in terms of patient care. Now, I'm not saying take my ICP monitor away. I'd be pretty lost if I didn't have all of my monitors. But you have to be realistic in your own reality with where the money goes. For much of the world, the answer is to should we monitor ICP is no. Not really no, but not yet. Because with with a good ICU, attentive care, good pre-hospital care, which is an issue, obviously, you can do well. Now, I'm not saying don't monitor, but I'm saying that you have to look in your own reality where the money should go. Don't just blindly follow publications from high-income countries and academic authors. So the question really, though, is if you have monitors or you have 
limited number of monitors, which patient should monitor? And that's a huge question, and it's unresolved at any level of resources. Which patients might benefit from ICP treatment? When you look at the spectrum of traumatic brain injury, which I'm saying all patients who present with a Glasgow Coma Scale score of eight or less, which was the study group for the, the best trip trial, all of those patients were in the study group. You need to look at the, the fact that all of those patients, everyone will benefit from good critical care. But the question is, which ones have intracranial hypertension? Now of that group, there will be a fair number of people who have a brain injury, but no elevated ICP. So those are patients where ICP monitoring is actually not necessary. It may be useful to sort out who doesn't have ICP problems. It may be useful to shorten ICU stays, but it isn't man mandated to make the patient better. So then you get the group with ICP elevation, patients we should monitor. But of that group, there will be, will be a group where the brain is a bit swollen because it's injured, but the ICP elevation is mild and it may not even need treatment. I mean, an ICP of 20 to 25, if it's not going to go much higher, may not even need much in the way of treatment. We may actually overtreat a group of patients. Then there's another group on the other end of the spectrum where you have severe intracranial hypertension, which is not not something that if you control will make the patient better. It's a manifestation of severe brain injury. It's a, just a, a marker that the patient has a bad brain injury. And in the year 2020, it isn't something we can fix. We will work very hard to lower the ICP in those patients, but it may not produce good outcomes. And that's probably the group that was studied in the, the uh, rescue ICP trial. So the actual group that needs treatment, where ICP treatment will actually make the difference between good and poor outcome is relatively small. It's important. It's probably so small that we couldn't detect it in the best trip trial, to be honest. But And it's important, but it's really only a relatively small group of the total group of patients with severe brain injury. These are patients we must monitor if we can detect them. But how do we detect the, them from the group of severe traumatic brain injury patients. How do we tell that group? Well, the truth is that currently we probably can't. Maybe some non-invasive monitoring will help with that, but currently we probably can't. What we can probably do is come up with a group more like this, where there will be some patients that will overtreat because they have mild ICP elevation that may not even need treatment. And there will be the group where the ICP is really elevated and lowering it is not going to really make them that much better. It, it, it's the brain injury that's determining their outcome. And then in that group in the middle, there is the group that will make a difference. That's probably the group that we can detect. If you can detect that group, that's the group to monitor. Or if you don't have a monitor, that's the group to treat for suspected intracranial hypertension, SICH. How do you tell them? Well, if you go to the guidelines, you get the Narayan study from 1982. I don't know if anybody remembers 1982, but this was actually a very poor study. It was kind of the best that we had when we wrote the guidelines, but it's not a very good study. It's a, just a correlation of what was available, what signs correlated with increased ICP. Uh, actually, a much better study it, it was the Alali uh, analysis. In we developed a, a more sophisticated treatment protocol for patients without monitoring as part of the follow-up to the best trip trial. In that, we came up with some criteria to, for patients to be treated for suspected intracranial hypertension. Those were based on major and minor criteria. For major criteria, you need only one to be suspected of having intracranial hypertension. These are all CT findings, Marshall 3, Marshall 4, or a, a non-evacuated mass lesion. Then there are minor criteria where you need two or more to be tr to be suspected for intracranial hypertension, GCS motor of four or less, pupillary asymmetry, abnormal pupillary reactivity, or a CT of Marshall two. Now, those are the criteria that we came up with. Aziz Alali studied that group in a group of patients with monitoring, and he found that those selection criteria were actually relatively sensitive although not particularly specific in terms of identifying patients with intracranial hypertension or at risk of it. 90, 94% sensitivity. Specificity is less. So it will result in some overtreatment, but again, sensitivity probably trumps specificity with what you want. You don't want to miss people, who, the treatment of, of whom will make them better. 
So if you're going to choose who to put ICP monitoring in, this is probably the better group of criteria to use, particularly if you have a limited number of ICP monitors and need to ration them. If you have monitors, these are the ones to put the monitor in. If you don't have monitors, these are the ones to treat for suspected ICP elevation. Now you have the protocols to treat patients without monitoring. The ICE protocol came out of the best trip trial and has been published a couple of times actually. And then there is the, the crevice protocol, which is a, a much more elaborated ICE protocol that's actually been studied now. Uh, we studied it in Latin America against a group that had no protocol and it was associated with better outcomes and uh, less resource use, shorter, shorter stays, et cetera. That th the analysis of this study has not been published. It's in submission to Lancet right now. But the, the study itself, the, the protocol itself is available in Jainer or Trauma. So for non-monitored patients or patients where you suspect ICP elevation, but you can't monitor it, this is a very reasonable protocol to use for those groups. And we've also published recently a, a, uh, a consensus conference on the treatment of patients with intracranial pressure monitoring, a, a consensus-based algorithm for managing ICP. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we've covered both the, the lack of ICP monitoring of, uh, situation and those places with ICP monitoring. Now, if you're going to monitor what device to use, this is an important question. You can use EVDs or you can use intraparenchymal model. And, and it's a big controversy. There are other monitors. Those are not recommended, at least according to the guidelines. They seem to be less sensitive. I'm not sure that they're of no use at all, but the recommended choice is between EVDs and intraparenchymal monitors. So let's look at the two. For the external ventricular drain, the pros are that they're cheap because it just takes a tube and they're available just about everywhere. They can be calibrated uh, at the bedside and you can drain CSF. Now that's not monitoring, that's treatment, but it is something you get with an EVD. The cons are bleeding on insertion, which is certainly greater than the interparenchymal devices. Infection, ventriculitis, abscess, et cetera, which is five to 15%. Clogging, they don't always stay open, they are tube. And leveling versus inaccuracy. You need to keep it level when you change the head of the bed or raise the bed, otherwise you get inaccurate numbers. The, in, the interparenchymal devices are very easy to put in. They are quick and easy. We put them in everywhere, ER, OR, ICU, et cetera. They're accurate without leveling because they're, they're internally transduced. They have good waveform display if you're into using waveform for compliance, and there is essentially no infection risk. The cons are they're expensive. That's probably the biggest one. They would use tons of them if they were cheap. Bleeding is possible. It's rarely surgical, less than certainly with uh, EVD. And it can't be calibrated in situ. There is the possibility of undetected drift. We have not found that to be, to be a, a big deal, but it is possible. It's a little bit more effort to put them in, the EVDs. Some places put them in only in theater. We put them in in theater or in ICU. But I can tell you that the place, the interparenchymal monitor is quite easy. Here's Carlos Rondina, an intensivist, putting them in in, in Latin America, it's a pretty straightforward procedure and it makes monitoring easier and quicker and you can initiate it early in the case. CSF drainage is the big difference there. That is a case of treatment, not monitoring. And it's a little different. I, I am not sure how much CSF drainage difference, how much difference it makes in really sick patients. It'll control mild ICP elevation sometime. But if you have really sick patients, I've never found it to be horrendously useful. We actually put intraparenchymal monitors in everybody first, and then we decide if they can use an EVD depending on how they respond to treatment. Now, a recent paper looking at just monitoring, we tried to eliminate um, the drainage as a parameter. So we used early placement as a monitoring device of EVDs versus intraparenchymal catheters. And we used prospective data for a randomized uh, uh, drug trial, the Sethrin trial. And what we found when we analyzed that data was that actually used just as monitors, 
we found worse functional and neuropsychological outcome and higher mortality associated with external ventricular drains. You can certainly look over this paper. It's not definitive, but it really does suggest that there are risks with uh, external ventricular drainage that don't attend in parenchymal devices. Now, we looked at this only as monitors, not as treatment devices. We did not look at it used specifically for uh, ventricular drainage. So the, the, I think the, the bottom line really is there's no gold standard. No one can tell you that you must use an EVD or an intraparenchymal device. It's really your choice. Now, I can tell you that in low resource countries, you can do this pretty cheaply. My friend Ubiel Lopez from Cuba used a pediatric nasotracheal suction catheter regularly and taught it to his colleagues in Cuba. They used it as an ICP monitor, a nasotracheal suction catheter, very cheap, hooked to a fluid based transducer. And so for a long time, you were more likely probably to have ICP monitoring in Cuba than you were in the US. Just, just saying that you can do, certainly do monitoring on a budget. So why should I monitor ICP? Well, you can use goal-directed treatment. You have known ICP versus suspected intracranial hypertension. You may be able to avoid over-treatment, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. You can most likely avoid under-treatment where you don't recognize that the ICP is as elevated as it is without a monitor, you would be able to use treatments that aren't used without ICP monitoring, such as neuromuscular blockade. If you're just going on imaging and clinical examination, you don't want to put someone under neuromuscular blockade because you lose the clinical exam. There's also indications for last tier treatment. Barbiturates are very little used without ICP monitoring. Although they're, I mean, they're only useful in a small group of patients, but you can't really tell who they are unless you have quantitative ICP. And then shortening ICU stay. You're just more efficient if you know exactly the ICP. And that's certainly something we saw in the best trip trial. We looked at two groups from the best trip trial, the diffuse injury three, the swollen patients who tend to have intracranial hypertension, and the evacuated mass lesions, who are also a, a large group that are at risk. And when we looked at treatments, the, the whole group of DI3s and the whole group of evacuated mass lesions had just about the same treatment between the groups. We then, then broke it down into pupils, normal versus abnormal, and neuro worsening for each group. And interestingly, you can see that for pupils, if you had normal pupils or abnormal pupils, you still had the same treatment. And if you had diffuse injury three or evacuate methylation, you had the same level of treatment. There wasn't the quantitative ICP to differentiate between those two groups. The only groups that really varied in terms of treatment from no to yes was neuro worsening clinical deterioration during the patient's stay, where the ICP treatment was escalated. <laughs> so this is an example of the sort of the insensitivity of the imaging and clinical examination to, to ICP, because you probably would rather not wait until the pupil started to go up or the patient started to deteriorate to escalate treatment if there was any way to avoid that. The only indication in the non monitor patient was neuro worsening. And the use of treatment varies by the presence of ICP monitoring. In the no ICP group, the general treatment for, for the two groups that were studied, the EML and the Deuce Injury 3, was prophylaxis. Hypertonic saline, which was approved in that group, or, or preferred in that group, and mannitol were given every four or six or eight hours in patients with suspected intracranial hypertension. That's what happens when you're suspecting it. You don't give it as a bolus because you don't have evidence of acute uh, uh, increases like you would with a monitor unless the patient deteriorates. So you, you kind of lose what is the most common treatment in patients with monitors. Um, the, ev everybody got CPP elevation to, uh, because you didn't know the ICP, so you tended to keep the MAP a bit high. So there's probably more use of pressors there. And some treatments, such as barbiturates, were very rarely used because you, you didn't have have a monitor that told you that you had an ICP of 35 that just wouldn't come down, which is the, the consideration group for tier three treatments. So there are certainly implications in terms of treatment of not having a monitor. In the absence of ICP monitoring, treatment really is prophylactic. It's based on the perceived risk of ICP elevation. <clears throat> and in certain groups, uh, such as diffuse injury three and the evacuated mass lesions, where you have a high risk of that, it's probably better to monitor. The results of this approach, there's little variability in treatment intensity, 
And the only consistent indicator for escalation of treatment was neuro worsening. There's no minute to minute decision making. In the absence of ICP monitoring, also the indications for tapering treatment are unclear. When can you back off the treatment of suspected intracranial hypertension? If you have an ICP monitor, you know the ICP is acceptable. If you don't, you guess it's acceptable. You thought it was higher then, and now you think it's it's less. It's true that in, in our studies that the use of monitoring tends to shorten ICU stay, which can be very important when you have limited ICU beds. So there are other benefits of monitoring ICP. So what methods do you use to guide duration of treatment is an important question. The issue really is to, is to balance over treatment and under treatment are both potentially toxic. The way we do it with ICP monitoring is kind of strange if you look at it in, in sort of a condensed form. If the ICP goes up, we tend to use a number of agents to drive it back down. And we tend to be very vigorous in that driving. So when the ICP goes up, we often add two or more treatments to, to drive it back down. And we repeat that until one of two things happens. The ICP stays less than 20, assuming the patient survives our treatment, or we get frustrated that we can't get it down and we do a decompressive craniectomy, which is probably the best shown in the, the uh, rescue ICP trial where true frustration did lower ICP, but didn't really have the best outcomes. So it's really important what threshold you treat. It's really important to think about what ICP is. Now, threshold values may represent physiologic thresholds. This, an example of that is the autoregulation breakpoint. That's physiology. That's determined by the physiology of the patient. There's also injury thresholds. And, and the classic one would probably be the, the ischemia. Now, these are often multifactorial. And ischemia is complex because it depends on the delivery, the metabolism, and the time. So it's not a straightforward threshold. But that's a threshold that if you go beyond that threshold, you will result in actual injury. And then there are treatment thresholds. Those are the goals we set for ourselves. CPP is an example, hematocrit. <clears throat> now, those are often relatively weak in terms of the evidentiary basis and their physiologic basis. And I think ICP th treatment threshold is an example of that because it's important to balance the risk benefit for any treatment. In the guidelines, the, the last guidelines, edition four, the level 2A recommendation was to treat ICP above 22. At level three, a slightly different recommendation was made, and that is a combination of ICP values and clinical and brain CT findings may be used to make management decisions. In other words, a softer threshold at a lower recommendation, based more really on what studies had been done than on physiologic evidence. <clears throat> At the level three, it was based a lot on the chamber study, where they used receiver operating curve analysis of a large number of prospectively collected ICP values. And they found that the sensitivity for ICP in predicting outcome was only 61% at 30 millimeters of mercury, higher than certainly any thresholds that are normally used. They also noted in their study that the ICP cutoff for all patients was 35, but in individual CT classifications, it ranged from 22 to 36, suggesting that with different CT classifications, there may be different optimal thresholds. They stated that it may be inappropriate to set a single ICP target as higher values may be tolerated in certain CT classifications. In other words, tailoring the treatment threshold to the patient. Hard to do, but potentially very valuable. Now, choosing a treatment threshold to avoid injury thresholds is important because we try to avoid treatment toxicity when chasing threshold values of uncertain variability. If you decompress people who actually don't need it, we have good evidence now that is not good for you. Probably what happened in the DECRA trial. The level two evidence suggests that 22 millimeters of mercury might be a reasonable treatment threshold. Certainly, when you first put the monitor in, you need a threshold. So I would suggest starting with 20 or 22. But when you look at all the studies that have been used to, to look at ICP treatment thresholds, all of those data come from patients who are already being treated at some threshold. Now that obviously confounds it because when you look at the influence of ICP above that threshold, you're not only looking at the influence of ICP, but you're looking at the influence of treatment and you're looking at how resistant that ICP was to that treatment. 
So was it is the toxicity of high ICP ICP toxicity only? Is part of it treatment toxicity? And should we be talking about ICP thresholds or ICP resistance to treatment? I actually think that what we've studied is resistance to treatment. ICP is primarily a marker of disease sense severity. It's been, that's been known forever. So that's what we were talking about earlier with the high ICP patients. So it's perhaps the main use of such a threshold is early post-injury to tell if how sick the patient is and then try to tailor the ICP treatment threshold and the entire treatment course to the individual patient. Is there a critical ICP threshold or is ICP just a factor in a more general TBI equation? Probably the latter, but that's something we still have to work out. ICP is really not a goal, it's a tool. It's like an alarm clock. It tells you that the brain is sick, but it doesn't tell you what is going on. In the patient that's giving you trouble, you need to use other monitored parameters to try to figure out what's going on and how to tailor treatment to that patient, which may involve adjusting some sort of classic thresholds of treatment. <clears throat> so what do you do now with the number? Well, that's a big deal. In the guidelines of the, that we published initially, we provided a treatment algorithm. We made that algorithm up at the time of publication without thinking too much of it. We gave it as a tool to be handy. It was extremely popular with the readers, but it was not evidence-based. And so in later editions, we left it out because a non-evidence-based algorithm in an evidence report is not internally consistent. And our audience missed it. Where is the algorithm? The, the, there was a huge sturm und drang about why we didn't put an algorithm in and people didn't understand the evidence bit. In the fourth edition, we did not put an algorithm in it because again, it's not evidence-based. Um, and there was a lot of unclear clinical interpretation of this. This was kind of a disappointing edition. It's a very well done evidence report, but it's hard to interpret by a clinician at the bedside. What does the guidelines tell me that I should do now? <clears throat> people wanted an algorithm. So how do you come up with one? Well, we did that. In Seattle in, in April of 2019, we had 43 international TBI opinion leaders from all over the world, from different disciplines gather to try to come up with a consensus-based algorithm that we could offer. <laughs> this has now been published online and, and finally in, in paper form. It's open access, so you can get it for free and download it. And interesting, it's been downloaded already 24,000 times since it was made available last December. And, and for those of you who wonder how important neurotrauma is in the world and within neurosurgery, it is this paper is now in the top 1% of all papers ever tracked in terms of uh, downloads by Altametrics. So the interest has been gigantic. So never think that neurotrauma is not a critical portion of neurosurgery. It, it is maybe the most critical. The algorithm recommends basic treatment. All patients who come into ICU need basic treatment, whether they have intracranial hypertension or not. And those are listed in terms of temperature management, um, uh, hematocrit targets, seven grams per deciliter, what to do with the head of the bed, sedation, et cetera. And there's a couple that are recommended, but not expected, end tidal CO2 monitoring and assertion of a central line. There are also a number of treatments that were rec not recommended as routine. And those included lumbar CSF drainage, the use of, of uh, loop diuretics, routine use of steroids, routine hypothermia. These are not things that you can't use, certainly not. But the group did not feel that they were sufficiently supported by evidence or that the risk benefit ratios were favorable to including them as a routine part of treatment. Now, the way we set up this algorithm was in tiers. So there were three tiers to each treatment and they're ranked by risk benefit ratio. So first tier treatments have the least risk and should probably be where you start. When possible, use the lowest tier. Now the tenets of this whole design is, are three principles. There's no rank ordering within a tier. So there may be a number of treatments within each tier, and there's no reason to use the top one first and the bottom one last. You can use any at your, your discretion. You also don't have to use all of the treatments within one tier before advancing to the next tier. And finally, if you think it's necessary, you can skip tiers. Decompressive craniectomy is tier three. But if early on you are having real trouble, you may choose to just skip to tier three to do that. 
So the tier three recommendations are, are hierarchy, but it's not mandated. So let's just look at the tiers briefly. These are published and online. They're pretty straightforward. So I recommend that for those of you who are interested, download it and go over it uh, in detail yourself or as a group, even better at your institution. So let's look at the first tier. And the first tier has the most basic treatments. It has the hypertonic solutions, PCO2 low end of normal, CPP at 60 to 70, analgesic sedation, CSF drainage if available, and consider a VEG monitoring to look at metabolism that might be driving intracranial hypertension. The second tier is a little more controversial. <clears throat> Neuromuscular blockade is there. It, the downside is that it does have toxicity. You lose your clinical exam. So if you're going to use it, give it a trial. If it doesn't help the ICP, don't continue it. Mild hypocapnia, potentially a risk of decreasing cerebral blood flow. So be careful with that as well. And then autoregulation-based CPP man manipulation. This is the first time that autoregulation has been written into a treatment threshold. It's actually kind of exciting. The way we did it was we used an MAP challenge to try to determine if there's autoregulation was present. The way to do that is you record basic parameters at the beginning of the challenge. You titrate a vasopressor to increase the mean arterial pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury or so for about 20 minutes. You record the parameters during that challenge and you evaluate for chain evidence of pressure autoregulation. At the end, you don't change anything else during that period. And at the end, you dial them back while you're analyzing the data. And if you see when you elevate IC, elevate mean arterial pressure, that the ICP comes down and then goes back up as the mean arterial pressure goes down, that's evidence of intact pressure autoregulation, a very useful parameter to, to know. If you see pressure passive behavior, so that as you increase the mean arterial pressure, the vessels don't constrict, they dilate, you increase the cerebral blood volume by doing that. And so the ICP goes up. And then when you dial the MAP down, the ICP goes down. This is pressure passive behavior, suggesting dysfunctional autoregulation. According to the guidelines, or the, the recommendations, if you have intact autoregulation, you can raise the cerebral perfusion pressure to lower the ICP by decreasing the cerebral blood volume. If you don't have intact autoregulation, you do not want to do that. So there's a second tier tool for you. Now, <clears throat> I have to say that this you need the proper bedside monitors to detect that. If you just look at the bedside screen, you only see a small bit of time as this occurs. If you can trend it on a computer or even on paper, you can see these occur over time much more clearly. So the importance of trending as in all ICU management, is very important in trying to determine what's going on with intracranial pressure and autoregulation. Third tier treatment is kind of as expected. It includes barbiturate coma, decompressive craniectomy, and mild hypothermia uh, as the last measure. Um, the barbiturates, again, are, are not an uncommonly used treatment. They're, the goal is ICP control, not serum levels or, or et cetera, or, or burst suppression. Burst suppression just tells you how far you can go on the, the, the titration end. Um, and again, you have to avoid hypotension or you undo all the benefits of barbs. So now do we have the correct approach to, to treating ICP? Well, to some extent, there's a question here that came up with the best trip trial. And I'd like to suggest that we have two approaches, really. We have the crisis approach, where you do nothing until the ICP exceeds the threshold, and then you vigorously drive it back down. Usually, interesting, if you look at what people actually do, using more than one treatment, increase the sedation and give hypertonics, et cetera. And then the ICP goes down and, and you stop treatment, you go back to sleep. And then you repeat this until the patient hopefully gets better. Now, in, when you're treating a suspected intracranial hypertension, you can't react to the in, instantaneous ICP. So it's a bit of a different approach. You suspect intracranial hypertension, and so you titrate like hypertonic salience every certain number of hours. And so what you end up doing, uh, at least as far as we can tell, is creating an environment of sort of a static lower ICP. Now, it may not be as low. It may be a bit high, actually, but it's not a crisis approach. It's more of a tranquility approach. And the question is, is that actually physiologically better? If you detect intracranial hypertension problems, would it be better to titrate sort of a tranquility approach than a crisis approach? An interesting question, one that hasn't been asked, really. <clears throat> How long to monitor, finally, is the last question. 
And it's actually important, particularly if you have limited resources. It's never been resolved. And we use the consensus process to try to resolve this because all of these people have to decide when to take an ICP monitor out. So we used what's called heat maps to help determine that. We took a matrix and the matrix had patient clinical condition in it. So we had what the CT looked like, diffuse injury one, evacuated mass lesion with no swelling, diffuse injury three, evacuated mass lesion with post-op imaging suggested cisterns are gone. We had the Glasgow motor score at the time of decision-making. What the pupils had done, were they, were they abnormal on admission or, or normal on admission, normal versus abnormal? And then we also looked at it at various times. So the ICP has been acceptable for 24 hours, for 48, 72, or greater than 72. And we asked everybody to consider three different severities and vote for each condition what they would do in terms of removing a monitor. We used a traffic light to try to indicate it. Red is no. Green is, I would take it out. Yellow is, I'd be cautious. We combined the votes and we got heat maps. So for patients who you had an ICP monitor in and they never had intracranial hypertension, this is the heat map. You can see people are paranoid at 24 hours in all but the most well patients to take it out with only 24 hours of acceptable ICP, even in patients who never had intracranial hypertension. It, it varies. They're more willing at 20, 48 hours, but you can see there's a number of people who are still going to wait much longer, particularly for patients with worse exams. <clears throat> now, with a group of patients who had intracranial hypertension that required tier one treatments only, and it's now been controlled, the heat map had more red and, and less green. Even for the same intervals, same, same matrix, matrix the, the people wanted a longer period with normal ICP. Now, this is not what we do in my institution, but this is sort of how to think about how you would take out the ICP monitor because it's never been determined before. It's never been studied. These are patients who you really had to work on to get ICP control. I mean, tier, tier, tier three treatment. They were about your sickest patients. And in this group, this is what the heat map looks like. Almost nobody would have their monitor taken out if their ICP had just been controlled for 24 hours, even 48 hours. Most people want 72 hours or longer of normal ICP if the patient has required a lot of treatment along the way. And the reason this is important is not only that, that, that it hasn't been studied, but it also determines how long the patient is going to be in the ICU Anybody with an ICP monitoring re requires other treatment. They're usually intubated, they're, they're not, uh, they're, they're more sedated, et cetera. So there's a lot of implications to keeping a monitor in longer than necessary. There is no solid data, but these algorithms can help you with your decision-making in terms of what 43 of well-known international opinion leaders would do as a group. So to summarize, I think what we have is that ICP monitoring or not, all severe traumatic brain injury patients should be aggressively treated in ICU. You can do a very good job. You can achieve satisfactory outcome. There's probably some patients who really do need that quantitative data, but it's a relatively small group. So if you don't have monitoring, don't think that you can't do excellent neurotrauma care. The next is that patients with suspected intracranial hypertension should undergo ICP treatment. So again, suspected intracranial hypertension or proven, they still need ICP treatment. And I would very strongly suggest that, that on a daily basis, you make those determinations. Intracranial hypertension treatment is best guided by ICP monitor. I don't think there's any doubt of that. We may not be using it perfectly, but if you suspect intracranial hypertension and you have a monitor, please monitor. And then finally, all TBI treatment should be done according to shared treatment protocols. It shouldn't depend on who's on for the day and which unit. You should, as an institution, have treatment protocols that you apply to patients. So there's not so much variability. It appears to improve outcome and increase treatment efficiency. It doesn't have to be what we've come up with by Cybic or ICE, et cetera. Those may be used as a tool to make your own protocols, et cetera. But I would strongly recommend a unified treatment protocol for every institution or group. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Randy, for a very illuminating talk. Obviously, it has increased my awareness and I'm sure uh, rest of the participants as well. Uh, before um, I ask my participants to um, enter into the discussion and ask a question, I have a question for you. How would you compare uh, the analysis of an individual wave and the trending of waves over a period of time for a better management answer? Well, <clears throat> I tend to think of the implications of ICP as being herniation and right. ischemia. If I'm worried about ischemia, I monitor it. So I have to admit, I put in a brain tissue oxygen sensor. And <clears throat> I look at the correlation of elevated high pressure when the patient's ICP goes up, either because you stimulate it or spontaneously. And then I want to know, what did the pupils do? And we use pupillometer, et cetera, so we get pretty good pupil measurement. And what did the Lycox do? If the ICP goes up and the pupils don't change, and the cisterns don't look too bad on the CT, I'm thinking the risk of mild ICP elevation is probably not terrible for herniation. If when the ICP goes up, the Lycox doesn't desaturate, the brain tissue oxygen doesn't drop, I'm thinking that the, that the patient is not particularly sensitive to mild increases in hypertension in terms of oxygen delivery. They may have autoregulation, so we test that as well. So if they do that, I will try to get the patient off pressors by adjusting the cerebral perfusion pressure, maybe down from 60 to 70 to 50 to 60. And I may change the ICP treatment threshold higher so they're requir requiring less treatment. I continue to track them to see if that was the right decision. But I try to titrate the ICP threshold based on herniation concept and ischemia concept to the patient rather than just use a number over time. You see, uh, th thanks very much. I, obviously, it has uh, cleared so much. Uh, if you give a MAP challenge, you know, this MAP challenge is not very frequently available everywhere, although ICP monitoring is there. So you really have a waveform in front of you. You have those numerics because ICP is just not numerics. It's, it's a complex interplay of so many things. But what we had been discussing earlier was that if we are looking towards a brain compliance and that brain compliance is going down and we have that uh, tidal wave, which has started to curve up in comparison to the P1. So probably that is the time when the brain compliance is lowering. Mm -hmm. So uh, could is it a possibility that this time window can be uh, taken as the one where you would like to intervene and do something in terms of uh, an escalated um, intervention like uh, decompressive craniotomy? Yeah, I think that's a that that's the question of herniation. That's the question of <clears throat> the brain's ability to tolerate increased pressure, even if it isn't being ischemic. And if you have lousy compliance, yeah, the patient is at risk of being hurt because they can't tolerate the any change in intracranial blood volume or. or edema, et cetera. I, that we also use the compliance, certainly that. And someday, hopefully, we will have an actual compliance monitor rather than just looking at the waveform. But that's exactly what you're talking about, is a patient with a normal waveform and an ICP of 25 doesn't bother me very much. A patient with an abnormal waveform and an ICP of 25, I'm going to lower the ICP. And I'm going to think, what am I going to have to do to avoid herniation? I, I wouldn't necessarily decompress them just for the abnormal waveform, but I would watch that patient very closely and keep decompression as your arsenal, as a tool. All right, thank you. Now, uh, I thought that probably this interaction between two of us would give substantial time to our audience to phrase their questions and the discussion. So if there is any question, please come up. And this is the time when you should ask the champion neurosurgeon about it. So there is a question actually from Vikram Shakya. And the question is, how, frequ how frequently would you suggest changing an EVD? Uh, you know, usually they say five to seven days. Is there any, um, uh, any kind of evidence to that? Um, <clears throat> if you use actuarial analysis, like the insurance companies do for risk, the risk appears to occur at the time of insertion. And then it manifests itself over over time. And that the major risk, so is, is colonization or contamination at the time of insertion. And then it shows up three, five, seven days later as an infection. So the, the biggest risk actually is around insertion. 
Um, if you, you use good monitoring technique, and you probably should use para-insertional antibiotics, a dose before you do it, and good sterile technique, there is no solid evidence that within the first five to seven days that changing it actually will change the, the infection risk. So we tend to monitor the ICP at least twice a week microbiologically, but I'll leave them in for seven days before I'll get antsy and want to change it. Um, and and it rarely, we don't actually don't use evident, uh, external ventricular drainage all that, that often because our first monitor is always the interparenchymal device. I would not suggest changing it routinely at three to five days because I think that you then expose the patient to the risk of insertion, which is bleeding and contamination. Okay, there's a question from Swan Kambu. Uh, Swan, please tell us where you're from and you can ask your question. Yeah, I am working as an uh, assistant professor of neurosurgery at Jinnah Hospital, Lahore. And uh, I have a question from uh, Professor Handel that, what are your comments that how many patients uh, with severe traumatic brain injury who are having such a meshed brain, they have their uh, ventricles negotiable? So whether we go for an EVD and uh, uh, treating on the basis of uh, that, is it better to just uh, apply the partial tools, manage the ICP on the basis of pharmacological and uh, ventilation? Well, I, I mean, you're, that's what we do. Uh, here at Harborview, where we put a couple hundred ICP monitors in a, a year, we, we very rarely use external ventricular drainage. Uh, I find that if I'm adjusting the threshold based on the patient's needs, a little mild intracranial hypertension, which is what is best treated with just drainage, I don't necessarily even treat it because I don't think it harms the patient if it's safe and the compliance is good and they're not ischemic. In some patients where you're really having trouble and you're trying to avoid something like decompression or barbiturates, we will occasionally put an external ventricular drain in for the draining the CSF. And, you know, as neurosurgeons, actually, we're pretty good at hitting ventricles that may not be in the normal place, even if they're quite small. It does have risks, no doubt. Um, and, you know, to be honest, if you're really having a lot of trouble, putting an external ventricular drain in may work for a few hours or like 12 hours, et cetera. And then the ventricles collapse and drainage stops. So now you may have a monitor, but you no longer have a good drain. So I just have used it less and less, to be honest. If in the best of all worlds, what we would have maybe cheaper intraparenchymal monitors, I would put intraparenchymal monitors in everyone and only drain those where I think that the drainage may keep me from having to escalate to much more extreme levels of treatment, where they just need a little more treatment. If they need a whole lot more treatment, I usually don't find that placing an EVD for drainage gives me that much effect. Okay, uh, Tariq Khan, would you like to give some comment before we move on to the next talk? Thank you very much, Randy, for an excellent talk. Uh, you know, because of the money constraints in NMICs, uh, uh, people are using external ventricular drainage to measure ICP and drain mm -hmm. the CSF. I think the drain is part is secondary, but it's cheaper to do ICP monitoring with that. I also must like to add that uh, thank you very much for introducing me to the CRIVICE protocol. In our institution, we uh, last few months we started this protocol um, by by doing um, uh, regular clinical examination. Uh, CT scans, and I see a lot of benefits in it. It's still very early uh, for us to say, you know, how has it improved the stay in the ICU, etc. But I think people who can not monitor the ICP, I think this is one way to go in that. Thank you. Thank you. Salman, <clears throat> hey, I have a question for Randy. All right. Please go okay. ahead. Yeah, so burning question. I, um, yes, please. Yes, I appreciate the uh, change of philosophy and the communication is the philosophy. The approach is not follow a number, but follow a ratio. So don't you think that there is a risk that some people could uh, share the crisis, uh, crisis approach and tranquility approach? And uh, the people can think uh, that maybe if I want to apply the tranquility approach on the crisis approach, maybe I have to choose my next steps 
with a lower threshold of ICP. I mean, maybe the crisis approach, I have, I, maybe I wait too much for my intervention. And maybe if I apply the tranquility approach with a reduced threshold, maybe I could be more physio physiological. What do you think about this risk? Well, I, I don't think that whacking someone with a bunch of treatments every few hours in an irregular basis is really good medicine, but it's been what we've done for a long time. We have not worked out the tranquility approach. We just kind of sorted it by looking at what was done in the best trip trial and figured and, and realized that it was a di totally different approach. I don't, I think you're, it's a good thought. And interestingly, there was a very small attempted RCT at mannitol dosing based on ICP or just scheduled in patients, all of whom had ICP monitoring. It was a guy, done by a guy named White and it was done many years ago. It was way too small to be meaningful. But what they found interestingly enough is in the patients who just received mannitol on a routine basis, the ICP, the mean ICP was actually lower. So it was actually kind of more effective. Um, so I think it's it's an interesting idea. It's a brand new idea kind of. And I think it's worth while investing it might be worthwhile actually setting up a trial, looking at everybody getting ICP monitoring and then being randomized to crisis or tranquility and to see what the impact on treatment, dosing, outcome, ICU length of stay is. I can't answer the question yet. Yeah, Corrado, can I, uh, can I um, also enter into the discussion by saying that very long ago, when we never had the facility of ICP monitoring and good ICUs, we were just reliant on mannitol. Either you give them in a bolus dose or in a continuous dose. At the end of the day, we found out that the bolus doses, they are working very well with us. And they would generally be between the recommended high to the low. And the patients were doing actually very well. So the tranquility approach, perhaps it's also, I would say, not based on sci any scientific evidence, I would say, but even my gut feeling is that this tranquility approach is working very well. Yes, I think so. I think so too. And actually, we're, we're sort of looking at it here at Harborview. But I think, you know, rather than just jumping from one idea to another, it would really be worthwhile putting together mm -hmm. a study on this. And it would be easy Absolutely. enough to do. Everybody gets an ICP monitor, you get randomized to the two trials, and you see what happens. I think it's worthwhile because it's it's actually a very interesting question. And uh, and and the cost okay. is obviously one of the main factors. Just so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Navid, we, we must move on. We are short, right, we're running okay. short of time. Has so Bari joined uh, us? Really, we, no, he hasn't. Has so you, you can introduce oh, Corrado. It's fine. Right, okay. Uh, so um, uh, it's again my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Corrado. And before that, I must thank Randy for obviously a very evocative <laughs> talk, as usual, I would say. And it has obviously increased uh, many dimensions, uh, shown us so many dimensions about ICP monitoring. And I would now quickly move on. I think we are um, much behind our time. Uh, and I would like to invite Corrado. So the, he's a chairman of neurotraumatology section, Italian Society of Neurosurgeons, member of NTCWFNS, and we have the honor of him being with us to, to, tonight or to e evening, I would say at this end, and obviously at the other end again, it's an evening. So may I request you to please uh, give us a talk on the cranioplasty, and I'm sure that there is a trial which has been going on, which, which you would like to share with us. Okay, thank you. You can see the presentation? Yes. Yes, we can, we can do okay. that. Yes, sure. First of all, of course, uh, I have to, talk, to thank the Pakistan Society for this kind of invitation. And I have to talk about C3 results. What is a C3? C3 is this consensus conference on cranioplasty that uh, uh, has been held during ICRAN 2018. That is the World Federation of Neurosurgical Traumatology Committee. The working group is a, a group coming from high income countries and low and middle income countries. So people coming from Nigeria, USA, Brazil, Poland, Finland, Italy, UK, India, Germany, Belgium, Greece, and South Africa, and so on. And the needs of a consensus conference rise from the lack of evidence that are about cranioplastic. And as suggested by Randy, 
uh, during that uh, conference, when we have an, an not enough evidence, we need to talk about the experts to understand the agreement and, uh, and especially the disagreement. And the lack of evidence affects uh, all the topics about neuro, about the cranioplasty, uh, about indication. We all know uh, since uh, 20 years ago where the Cambridge group with this elegant paper by Marek Chosnika show us that the amplitude before cranioplastic doesn't work and after cranioplastic it works. So that means that we have to close the box to uh, have a restoring of CSF circulation. But this uh, neurophysiological restoring, including the restoring of cerebral blood flow, is absolutely not co connected, not directly connected with a good outcome. So even if with the cranioplastic we restore a neurophysiological balance, that doesn't mean that we have a good outcome. And about the techniques, the surgical techniques, there are several um, alternative techniques uh, reported in literature, uh, like the step ladder expansive cranioplasty, where we can calculate on CT scan the additional volume uh, need for allotment of the brain. And there are other um, techniques like the floating cranioplasty just with uh, loose stitches or the uh, musculoskeletal um, flap proposed by Adelaide from Nigeria, or the four quadrant osteoplastic decompressive craniotomy that um, uh, allow more space for the brain swelling. And all of, all of these techniques are reported by low and middle income countries, uh, most probably to avoid the second additional surgery of cranioplastic. But to be honest, 13 years ago, this uh, injury craniotomy uh, was reported by the West Virginia University, so from high income countries. Um, another area of uncertainty is about the material. Uh, still now we can consider autologous bone as a gold standard, but we have to take in consideration that the bone is the only material related with a direct complication, the bone flap resorption. Uh, and the uh, rate of bone resorption is reported up to 20%, uh, as in this recent meta-analysis. So about five years ago, we still not have an idea about the ideal material because any material mismatch with the ideal feature of cranioplasty. Uh, but uh, analyzing the literature of this year, the last year, the consideration are not change it and still now we need prospective long-term studies to understand which material is the best material. For sure we are uh, we know that the surgical side infection is the most common complication but this complication the surgical side infection is absolutely not related to the material but is related to the site of cranioplasty. So the bifrontal cranioplasty uh, is is the, the cranioplastic <laughs> more associated to the infection. And, uh, and there is no, um, no difference about the material. So the, um, the most prognostic and favorable factor for infection is the site of cranioplastic, that is the bifrontal cranioplastic. Another area of uh, uncertainty is timing, huge uncertainty. And this because not all the patients are the same patient. When we perform a cranioplastic, usually we uh, can assist at this, mainly these three kind of patients, a depressed brain, a normal brain, or a brain swelling with, uh, with or without the enlargement of the ventricles. For sure, this, those are three patients, different patients. And for this patient, we can have the same uh, clinical consideration and timing consideration. So the, uh, actually um, the most part of literature uh, is prone that there is no difference between early cranioplastic and late cranioplastic. Uh, but a big part of literature is uh, report that early cranioplastic is better than uh, late cranioplastic in terms of uh, 
lower complication rate and better outcome. Uh, just two uh, authors reports that early cranioplastic is worse than late. But one of the, the, um, uh, one of the big problem at the, in literature, early cranioplastic is reported in a different timing from weeks to months. Usually early cranioplastic is no more than three months, but uh, there are other uh, authors that reports that our early cranioplastic is uh, in four weeks or two weeks. So this is another problem for the um, analysis of literature data. So what is clear at, that the timing doesn't affect, doesn't affect the neurological outcomes. And uh, it, it should be clear that the timing is not a chronological number. We have not to, um, to take the time as a, just a cutoff of days. Uh, the um, cranioplastic should be performed as soon as is possible. And the possible means when there is a resolu resolution of brain swelling, or uh, there is the absence of uh, infectious state, or when the patient is uh, stable in a clinical uh, and or a hemodynamic point of view. And about hydrocephalus is another uh, areas um, after timing with a high grade of uh, uncertainty because we have a high grade of lack of evidence. Um, at, the beginning of the at the beginning of the last century, there is a consideration of Dendy that uh, he said that it, it is very difficult to prove uh, a post-traumatic hydrocephalus. And I think that still now this consideration is valid. It's valid and uh, the so uh, huge data about radiological criteria for post-traumatic hydrocephalus proves that uh, uh, still now we have no uh, uh, high sensitivity and specificity uh, radiological criteria for post-traumatic hydrocephalus. And the same consideration is about the CSF dynamics tests. Um, so uh, this is another problem to have a diagnosis for post-traumatic hydrocephalus. And when we think that we have a post-traumatic hydrocephalus to treat, another uncertainty is when to treat. Uh, the data or literature is less prone to treat uh, the, hydrocephalus, the hydrocephalus before cranioplasty, uh, but um, as usual, no big evidence about this. And for pediatric cranioplasty, all this, consider all this consideration for adult are the same for pediatric. Uh, with uh, uh, another big problem that there is the, the number of series. We have no so huge series of uh, uh, cranioplastic in pediatric population is rare. And so the consideration of seven years ago of this uh, systematic review are about the same of this uh, systematic review of the last year. So we need long-term multicenter core studies. So uh, all these controversial are um, discussed in five separate, separate expert meeting rooms at, uh, at ICRAN 2018. So the expert talk about these topics. And after uh, that, we, that the, the expert meeting rooms finish the discussing, uh, all the statements coming out from these rooms uh, has been voted in uh, a plenary assembly of the consensus meeting. And uh, so about indication and techniques, uh, the assembly reached an agreement, uh, more than 90% about uh, the need of absence of medical contraindication to perform a cranioplastic. And uh, the indication are not only the anatomical reconstruction, but uh, the uh, cranioplastic is a therapeutic act. So the cranioplastic is indicated also to try to restore uh, the physiological balance and to promote the functional and physiological recovery. And uh, this room uh, decide with agreement of 92% that uh, when there is a need of CSF diversion, the diversion should be perioperative, temporary. I mean, the, uh, the assembly uh, won't communicate that uh, the uh, 
sicep diversion should be included in a surgical workout of cranioplastic when there is a suspected of uh, uh, hydrocephalus. About materials, uh, the 100% uh, of assembly is agreed that the bone graft uh, carries the risk of resorption. And uh, for this reason, when you are planning to perform a autologous bone graft, uh, so it's better that you plan a early cranioplastic. And uh, about the custom-made implants, the assembly decided that we need a further study. So that means that the assembly um, is prone to consider the bone the first choice material. Uh, and uh, if you have no available bone or a problem about the bone, you can consider the rest of material. Uh, less agreement, but still valid agreement because it's more than 80%, less than 90% is about the material, timing, and the influence of storage uh, on resorption rates of the bone. Uh, about the timing, 100% uh, of agreement about the need to, to consider the clinical condition of the patient wound status, systemic infection, um, antithrombotic medications, uh, when you decide uh, when to perform cranioplastic. Uh, also, this group uh, of uh, experts won um, emphasize the connection between autologous bone, cranioplastic, and early cranioplastic. And uh, what was surprising for me and that poor neurological status and skin colonization anyway are not contraindication for cranioplasty. And about the definition of a threshold, all the assembly uh, was agree with 86%, about 87%, so high uh, level of agreement, that the definition of a threshold is artificial. So it's just to uh, understand in which slot uh, we have to put the patient. And uh, they define an early, uh, ultra early cranioplastic uh, up to six weeks, six weeks. An early cranioplastic is when it's performed between six weeks up to three months. Intermediate cranioplastic uh, from three months up to six months. And uh, a delayed cranioplastic is defined when it's performed after six months. And uh, uh, another uh, statement that this group of experts want to emphasize that the cranioplasty may improve a neurological function and early cranioplastic may enhance this effect. That means that uh, even we have no enough evidence, it's clear that all the assembly is uh, more prone to, uh, to early cranioplastic than a late cranioplastic. Now we have to decide with uh, the future studies uh, the threshold of early or ultra early, but it's clear that uh, the assembly is more prone uh, for early cranioplastic. The hydrocephalus rooms is the rooms where the discussion was more articulated uh, and uh, the rooms producted a lot of statements and uh, dividing the statements about diagnosis of hydrocephalus and surgery for hydrocephalus. Um, it's it's a clear that we still now, we have no uh, good uh, quality uh, of diagnosis criterion. Uh, we need uh, more um, uh, evidence about uh, the dynamic study of uh, CSF circulation and for electrophysiological test. Uh, and uh, uh, less grade of agreement, but always high grade of agreement, I mean, more than 80%, is about the outcome measure. Uh, we need uh, a universal scale of evaluation. Maybe the coma recovery scale could be a good uh, way to follow the patient, uh, but also, also the imaging test to follow a patient with the uh, ventricular uh, enlargement. Um, we need to understand the, the radiological follow, the best 
radiological follow-up. And about the surgery, um, also in this case, the assembly is prone to consider a um, treatment of hydrocephalus, a defined treatment of hydrocephalus after craniplastic. So uh, before or uh, contemporary to craniplastic is better to, when is indicated, to use uh, a EVD or lumbar drainer, but uh, to, um, to, to perform a defined CSF diversion is better uh, to perform after craniplastic, of course, in case of dubbed or hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus, not in case of a clear hydrocephalus. But the discussion was uh, conducted uh, very uh, rough about this, uh, this topic. Pediatric craniplastic is not the uh, topic of this uh, uh, presentation, but just to complete the uh, reports of uh, C3, uh, look at about the grade of disagreement. Uh, the pediatric craniplastic group showed a higher rate of disagreement. The other rooms doesn't show this uh, amount of disagreement. So with the statement, Appro not approval because less than 80%. And uh, this agreement was about the limit of uh, age. Uh, 18 years is for many people too high to define a pediatric. There, are, there is no agreement about autologous bone for all the age of children and about the image, imaging. Uh, and uh, so it's clear for pediatric craniplastic about the bone that they prefer osteoconductive material. Uh, for surely for child more than three years. And uh, below three years, the osteoconductive rule remains unclear. But uh, for child more than three years, if the, if the bone is not available, uh, osteoconductive uh, material is preferred. And about the size of cranioplastic, the cranioplastic uh, uh, should be proportional to the size of the child. About the timing, same consideration that we, uh, we have to decide the better timing. Uh, so it's clear to talk about complication outcome just for cranioplastic is difficult because the events before cranioplastic can have an influence on the course after craniplastic. Uh, and so the future perspective is that we need high quality methodological future research about alternative technique of bone removal or cranial reconstruction. We have to understand the ideal material of craniplastic uh, and we have to define a relationship between the time of craniplastic and neurological outcome, especially for hydrocephalus occurrence. And for the hydrocephalus, we need specific diagnostic criteria and outcome measures. Pediatric craniplastic is still a problem for the highest lack of evidence. Um, and we hope so that uh, this is the invitation for the young people to, to start with this uh, uh, high quality methodological future research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerardo, for an excellent uh, presentation and adding to our knowledge regarding cranioplasty. Uh, I would uh, just request if there are any questions um, which are directed towards Gerardo so we can have his opinion on that. Question about? Uh, may I uh, say a few words? I think uh, the consensus uh, statements on cranioplasty was a very important step uh, for, for many, many neurosurgeons. This and the previous consensus on decompressive craniectomies, both, uh, because people did not really think very much about when to do a cranioplasty, what to do with the hydrocephalus, what is the importance of the cranioplasty? Because previously, many people felt that cranioplasty maybe was only for cosmetic purposes. But the actual fact of the matter is that it's not just cosmetic, but it needs to improve the physiology of the brain and, and the CSF movement in the brain. So I think, um, Corrado, thank you very much. 
uh, for your excellent talk. And uh, I think it was, you went through great uh, lengths to develop this consensus meeting uh, in, 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 in Italy. And uh, I think it will benefit everybody. And I know you went through a lot of pains trying all of us to get all the material together and it took a very long time. Uh, thank you, Gerardo. Certainly, uh, everybody would agree with uh, what Dr. Tarek Khan, Tare Khan has, uh, just said, but there are certain practical problems. And the limitations that they, I'm going to talk about is which affect countries like ours, low and middle income countries. You see, uh, delayed cranioplasty is often the case in our situations. Reason being that uh, you really don't have a place to find for preservation of the bone flap except subcutaneously. Uh, cryopreservation is perhaps out of question uh, in places like ours. So the only place would be a subcutaneous placement. And most of the times when you take out these bones and you replace them, then you have very rightly pointed out that resorption is a problem. The edges, they don't come together. And then the failure starts to occur. So how do you look at this problem uh, from your consensus point of view? Are there any recommendations about that? Uh, yes, we analyzed the literature and there is a meta-analysis uh, and these meta-analysis reports, uh, if you want, I can show you here, uh, uh, reports that there is no, absolutely not relationships between the storage of, of the bone and uh, the resorption rate. Anyhow, there is a statement of that room of material that uh, mm, and the statement reached just 86% of agreement because it was clear for all the assembly that the literature reported data, but the personal experience seems another. I mean, the personal experience of the expert that the, the abdominal pocket influenced the uh, uh, bone resorption, but the meta-analysis showed it is not true. Uh, so um, the, the statements that we are not sure about this data. And, and uh, um, the proof that the assembly is prone about what you said, that the assembly say that when you plan a autologous craniplastic, it's better that you choose an early craniplastic. I mean, leave the bone under the abdomen less time possible. This is the message, is hidden message. Uh, Th thank you. Very You're very right. I think everybody all over the world uh, who are using this technique obviously want to put these back as soon as possible. And that's what we have shown. And everybody else has shown all over the world. Although uh, the evidence is not that much uh, in big numbers, but still there. Uh, sorry, I think we just need to move on to our multiple choice questions uh, before uh, uh, we run out of time for Zoom. So, uh, uh, can, Imad, can you please share those multiple choice questions uh, with us, please? So, um, these are the questions um, shared by our, our um, faculty. Uh, directly to the responses? Yeah, it's fine. So, uh, so this, this, this is uh, TBI in ICU. Uh, Randy, uh, these are yours. You want to take them? Can you please enlarge this a bit, uh, Imad? Yeah, yeah I think uh, in, in, uh, I was trying to ask what is the most important monitored value. And I still personally very much think it's the neuro exam. Um, you know, if I, had, if I had one bedside monitor that I would keep above all others, it would probably be the well in, in my ic it would be the nurse who's there 24 hours um so i i would actually prioritize those as neuro exam number one blood pressure is also very critical and if i had to give up one i'd probably give up the icp certainly before the blood pressure or the neuro exam totally agree okay so i think i think uh, you know we need to learn from that uh, question because if you see if you ask the question this way then all of the above will come in but if you see some of the people who have uh, answered the other way, they have gone um, obviously more with ICP than anything else. And you need to understand that. Okay, next. Yes, Randy. 
Well, that's I, I think all of, all of the above is is certainly true. Um, in the ICE protocol and the crevice protocol, by people who've been doing this a long time, by consensus, the 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 major criteria for selection was the CT image, the presence of cisterns and the amount of midline shift, um, and then the mass lesion issue, pupillary responsiveness, the neuro exam were were used as minor criteria um still important but minor criteria and i'm not sure but the tendon reflex is certainly not going to help really with that but i think the 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 consensus criteria in the crevice protocol as tested by alali um it was the ct imaging that was the most important okay good uh next ah um all of the above. I guess that's always the default question. I, I often okay. leave that one out. Um, the 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 role, We haven't published this data yet. But we have very strong data now that if you look at a protocol, which we looked at the ICE protocol and the crevice protocol, and you compare them to people who don't have protocols, the outcome is quite significantly better. Um, the efficiency seems to trend toward being better, but the outcome is definitely better. So I would have to say that it's probably implication, the true implication of that is that variability in treatment isn't good. When it changes, depending on what doctor is on for the day, it's probably not good. So I would say you can follow the guidelines, but the actual evidence-based guidelines don't have a much of an algorithm. Hospital protocols, a multiple disciplinary approach are really important. You can adopt the protocols that we have produced. You can use them as a template to make your own protocols. But I would have to say that making protocols is the most important. Okay, I agree. Yes, next, please. So a critical ICP value must be lowered. Um, wow, amazing. The guidelines should be made. I'm not exactly sure what that means. I, I think as you heard from my talk, I would st always start with the threshold and the Brain Trauma Foundation evidence-based threshold suggestion is 22. So when you first put it in, if it's above 22, lower it. Then start the process of figuring out that patient. Okay, good. Okay, can we go to uh, Corrado's questions, please? Okay. Rada, you want to take them, please? Yes, okay. And uh, this is the first home, me uh, home message uh, for the people and uh, to understand that kind of plastic therapeutic act. And uh, so um, I'm happy this uh, anatomical reconstruction take just 8.2%. Okay, so it's the right answer. Okay, Matt, can you please uh, uh, zoom this a bit? Just enlarge it a bit. Some people can't read it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next. For selection of material, or okay, yes, this is the right uh, answer because, uh, and also this is for take home message that the bone graft is a risk of resorption but uh, should be considered the first choice for the adult. Uh, and there is no material. You know, uh, the pur one of the main purpose, hidden purpose of the C3, of the consensus conference, is um, try to fight the eminence-based medicine. I mean, that um, people that say, I say this, the, the peak is uh, the best material or uh, uh, no, uh, do not perform craniopathic without uh, lumbar drainage. I mean, there is a, when there is no evidence, when there is a, a space where the em, the eminence base have a, a possibility to arise. So the 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 C3 uh, the the purpose of C3 is to fight the eminence based medicine and try to share the experience of everybody uh, to understand. Uh, uh, better evidence in the future. Corrado, would you like to do a bacterial culture sensitivity before putting in that um, bone graft? Or the, uh, yeah, the bone there is, graft? A, there is a, I think, national, but I mean, in a lot of hospitals that I, I work, there is a protocol for the 
nostri la cultura before the processes even the uh, cranioplastic but also the um, in, uh, spinal instrumentation okay next but what what's clear and uh, i think that the um, a rehabilitator group that participated to consensus uh, and the colonization is not contraindication for kind of plastic. This is very important. Okay. Am I going to go next, please? Okay. And the, uh, also this is a right answer. And uh, um, the poor neurological status is contraindication. Uh, I, I suppose that someone could answer the fourth uh, questions because poor neurological status uh, sometimes uh, in, uh, could appear as a contraindication. Uh, but just poor neurological status uh, is not a contraindication. Maybe the, uh, the prognostication could be a contraindication. At least the prognostication could be a contraindication about the quality uh, of the cranoplastic, the costs of the cranoplastic. Of course, nobody wants to use uh, titanium or hydroxyapatite for all the cranoplastic. Uh, so the neurological status could be considered uh, in the prognostication of the patient. Okay. Okay, good. Next. Uh, complication of surgical sinus infection is the most common. Yes. I have to move the, okay. Depending on the timing and or material is, is this is also a um, tricky question. Uh, the, depending on timing and or material, because it's what the people feel usually. But the, the most important evidence is that the surgical site infection is the common uh, complication. So okay, the thank people you. are good. All right. Uh, thank you, Matt. Can you, can you uh, stop and sharing? Um, uh, before we close, I'd like uh, Randy and Corrado to give, uh, say a few words and Tarek Khan and uh, Naveed as well before we close here. Well, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, I think, again, your reality is your reality and the, the reality of people who publish is often nobody's reality. Um, it, it doesn't represent most of the world. For the ICP bit, I got some very intelligent questions here and on the chat room. Um, I think people understand the concepts, which you need to adapt them to your own reality. And you may end up mixing the crevice protocol and the cybic protocol side by side in, in your, your hospitals for patients that do get a monitor and don't get a monitor. I mean, I think adapting to your reality is important. I think that with respect to cranioplasty, I think there's the issues that I've seen in resource limited countries is that you, most people don't have the ability to store them outside the patient. The longer they are in the belly, the more they, the, the less well they fit. And it's really hard to get patients back into hospital for plasty with the timing of operating theater, funding, et cetera. It's easier to do it before they leave. And at Harborview here, we put them in really early. And I think that's something to consider. If you can get the bone back in before the patient leaves the hospital and before it it resorbs much in the belly. I have a feeling that would be of a real benefit in, in a lot of realities. Okay, brilliant, Corrado. Hey, but in, the, in that room, I fixed a lot of people coming from low and middle income countries uh, to talk about material because of course, uh, that room of material is the more controversial uh, topic uh, depending on the resource. So uh, um, when we organized the consensus, also with Tariq, we decided to put in the material room more people uh, from low-income countries because uh, uh, we cannot decide how the other uh, uh, environment. And uh, surprising, the, the conclusion is the, the abdominal uh, storage is not a, a 
evidence-based problem. Um, you can uh, take in consideration, for example, that in Italy is forbidden by law to uh, storage the bone in the abdomen. So we cannot more uh, store the, uh, the bone in the abdomen. Uh, so you can consider how different are the uh, behaviors. Uh, so the, um, the, the, the message is, for me, is independently where you store the bone, when you use the bone, make an early caramplast. But early depends on the clinical condition. Okay, Navid, please. Well, uh, despite uh, differences in reality between different geographical areas, I believe that uh, we learn a lot when we interact. And at least today I've gained a lot from both of the speakers. And uh, I hope that we continue this uh, ongoing trend of educating ourselves. This is so nice to be together, all of us together and learning from each other. I wished uh, we could have had more discussion on cranioplasty because there were so many questions left unanswered at a certain level and we can do them later on. But uh, one thing I would definitely like to add, now the bone, whether it is bone or it is other cranioplasty material, uh, we usually uh, put in these mini plates, but uh, for the uh, young neurosurgeons and the residents, I would like to add that we had been doing for a very long time, tying them up with silk sutures. And I can tell you that the union was excellent and there was no infection, minimal infection. So that is one of the things um, if we talk about poor countries or low or middle income countries where the plates are not available, the screws are expensive, you can put in those silk sutures. Brilliant. Uh, Tarek? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Randy, and thank you, Corrado. Uh, I think this idea of uh, doing ICP monitoring and the crevice protocol side by side is being practiced by us uh, uh, where we do the EVDs in the patients where we can insert them or not. And the other one, we do the crevice protocol. Um, the problem only in the lower income countries is doing repeated CT scans. Uh, but I think uh, generally speaking now, people have the ability to get them done. Uh, whereas the cranioplasty is uh, concerned, yes, there were many areas which, uh, which there was a lot of discussion on that. Uh, but by and large, a good consensus came out of it. Uh, and one interesting point which came out of it was hinge cranioplasty. We all had been doing hinge cranioplasty uh, for many years, uh, but not giving it a particular name really, you know, uh, just putting the bone flap and tying it loosely. Uh, now uh, Cambridge and um, uh, many of us are doing, uh, starting a study on the, looking at the, uh, the, the idea of hinge cranioplasty, especially for lower income countries, where they cannot afford two operations. Um, and also, you know, if they don't have to store the uh, bone flap in the uh, subcutaneous tissue. So that's something to look at as well. And Salman, thank you very much for organizing all these lovely webinars as always. Very grateful to you. I think, you know, I'm grateful to the two speakers, our moderator, yourself. I think all the participants who have always been there. Uh, we have learned so much over the last two months and uh, hopefully we'll continue to do so. The number of webinars we are doing, we're going to cut down after 15 days because I think many of the people are starting to uh, get busy with their work, etc. And we'd like to continue, but on a lower scale. Uh, Imad, have you got some uh, webinars to show that we have in the near future? So um, on um, Saturday, we have a Rotan Neuroanatomy course, and it's run by Miguel Urez and Pablo Gonzalez, uh, both from Spain. Azam and Hassan from US will be joining, and Deo Pajari from India would be helping them. And this is a, a first uh, session of the module three that we are doing. Uh, next. Can you show us what else you've got? And on Monday, uh, we have... Um, uh, two Koreans um, showing us how to do endoscopic uh, spine surgery, so a transformal disc by Hyun Sung Kim, and Lim is going to be showing about um, endoscopic uh, T lift. And we have Oscar from Portugal and Nicolay, who are the moderators. And this is the WFNS Spine Committee uh, getting involved here. Um, and then again, uh, we have the uh, neurotrauma guidelines from Tariq Khan. 
And uh, Farik Kemtaz is going to be talking about neuromonitoring. We have moderator is Franco Cervetti, and Randy, apparently, if he said yes, he will be joining us. Randy, are you there on that day? Yes. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. So it's a really pleasure having you all and looking forward to having you all again. Um, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Cheers, bye. Bye-bye.